And to you as we say a very good morning uh, to you wherever you might be listening from. It's nice to have you logged into to you break you for a Friday edition of the show. And of course, uh, double demerit points in effect all this long weekend. That is hot chocolate there. And it started with a kiss just on 11 to 8 now. We say a very good morning now to the Dubbo Region Mayor. Matthew Dickerson, nice to see you, sir. How are you? Do you ever say a good morning to you or is it always a very good morning? I'm not sure the difference between a good morning I, and a very I, good morning. I don't know. Apparently, I say this morning and morning too much anyway. Oh, do just you? ask Ian Thurlow. He's in the building today. He'll tell us. I'm sure that I say lots of different weird So you start stuff. to say... Is that a very bad morning for you? (laughs) I don't know what's going on. Is there something bad? A a good morning, exceptional morning, wonderful morning. Well, it's always, you know why it's a good morning? Because anytime someone comes in, it gives me something different to concentrate on. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I can help out. Yeah, I'm glad that you've stepped in because we've got some real important things to get to. Uh, We've been reporting here through Tudor News that uh, Dubbo Waste Management and Transfer Stations Matter are going uh, cashless from July 1. Mm. Tell me what's happening there because we know that there's been some break-ins out there. There have been some break-ins and a few things out there. As any business knows, when you've got to deal with cash, even if it's a small amount of cash, there's extra workload for the staff. You've got to have your float, you've got to count at the end of each day. So if you can reduce some of that workload, then the staff can do other more useful things. We analysed it and found that we were down to about 1.5% of all the transactions through Wallandra Waste Depot were with cash. So when it gets to that level, then it's probably at the point where you're not having a major impact on people. And the other thing we found is because there has been cash stored there, obviously with a float there, then people have broken in there. Mm. and. That's what they've stolen. They've been looking for the cash. There's not much else at the Waybridge area. You've got a computer system that runs the Waybridge, so it's not much there to steal, but a bit of cash in the float, sure, we'll steal some of that. Thanks very much. So you spend, from a council perspective, and often any break-in, Brett, you'll spend more money on fixing the impact of the break-in than the actual amount of money they got away with. So it's a bit frustrating. If we take the cash out of there, we think it'll make Quicker transactions, because it's quicker to pay for things with cards. You're not counting out the cash and giving change. So quicker throughput for people going through there. Reduce the likelihood of break-ins or damage because there's no cash there. And again, from a staff perspective, easier and quicker. End of the day, you're not trying to count up the cash and, oh, where's that extra dollar? I'll just go and count the cash again. Uh, Are you really expecting people not to break in, though? I mean, you've got computer there, you just mentioned. I mean, if if they don't know that there's no cash there, those people that are doing bad things are probably still going to break in, aren't they? Well, they're listening to two to you, Brett, so they now know that there's no cash there. So they say, well, there's no point breaking in there because there's Mm. no cash. I think it's pretty quick for people to learn and and hear that there's no cash there. They'll hear pretty quickly there's no cash transactions there. So So they'll know. That'll reduce the break ins. Oh, I think absolutely, because there's not much else. Again, the computer system that's there is dedicated for the Waybridge. Mm. You're not going to get much value in stealing that computer, taking it down to somewhere and say, hey, who would like to buy this computer that's dedicated to running the Waybridge at Dubbo Regional yeah, that's Council? Fair. What, what about for, you know, maybe a senior that only deals in cash, you know? I mean, it's still legal tender. Maybe they don't have a card or or they get confused using the card. They don't have a pin, etc., etc. I mean, what do you do for those people if they're bringing stuff out? Well, for a start, I think you've been very ageist, Brett. I think so seniors are very good at using modern transactional methods and most seniors I know have got Mm. a card, have got a way of paying for things. Sometimes you'll have some people, obviously one and a half percent of people who still pay for things with cash and that's why we've been out there, we've been talking about this for some period of time, talking about leading up to this Mm. so that people know when they go out there, I don't know too many people that haven't got some form of electronic method of payment for what they're doing. So it it hasn't been a big issue in terms of the Mm. one and a half percent and it's been mentioned to those people if it was only able to be done electronically, oh yeah, I could do that. Yep. I just happen to have some cash sitting around that I was spending. All right, and just to clarify, I had to deal with uh, a family friend's estate. That man, he was 82. He didn't deal in a key card. That's why I bring that up. I wasn't being ageist, <laughs> by the way. Uh, let's talk about the public feedback on Dubbo Regional Council's draft budget for the next financial year. Uh, it closed earlier th- this week. So what happens next timeline-wise? So we've now got a council meeting on the 27th of June, that's the next council meeting. All the feedback, and I haven't seen any of the submissions, I have no idea whether we've got 10 or 1,000 submissions in yet. All those submissions that go in will go into a report, councillors will see all those submissions, we get to read all of those. We get to then take on board feedback we've received from the community in general, look at those submissions, look at what we've thought about over the time since that budget's been out, 
and then on the 27th of June, we will go through and make a decision about the budget for next year. Typically, the main parts of the budget are probably going to stay similar to what they are now, but there might be some subtle changes there. We might look at some feedback from some of that those submissions that come in and say, oh, actually, we could spend a bit more money on that and a bit less money on that. So that'll be the debate that will happen on the 27th of June from all that feedback. Have you seen any of that feedback? Do you no. get to see it ahead of time? No, and I deliberately don't, and, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to see it anyway because mm. as councillors, we should all get that information at the same time. One of the things that I'm always interested in, Brett, is how many submissions we get because typically I find if you've got most things pretty right, you don't get many submissions. If you get things terribly wrong, you get inundated with submissions. So I've been on councils that have had say 15 or 20 submissions, I've been on councils that have had several hundred submissions, so you get a pretty clear view of what the community thinks. So that's one little point for me, I'll be interested to see just how many we get, but then you read through them all and some of them are very practical and you've heard me say it before. I love when people say, spend more money on this, but obviously you can't pull the money out of thin air, so spend less money on this thing over here. So you're getting an obvious uh, transaction there where you're taking it from one and giving it to another. And Mm. that, to me, that's the the best feedback because you're saying, well, I'd love to spend more money on that, but where do we get that money from? And so people are giving you those suggestions. Other people will just say, spend more on something. And so you get a variety of of useful and some maybe not so useful submissions that will come in. All right. Tell me about the workshop for the Dubbo Sale Yards because you've just held this, have you? Yeah, so we've had two things this week. Last night we had a workshop. That was the first time last night that we saw the EOIs that came in for the potential sale or lease. And then we also held our standard quarterly livestock market uh, advisory committee meeting. So that's a standard thing we hold each quarter with agents, with producers, with council staff, with councillors on that committee as well. So they've both been held this week. So a bit of discussion, I suppose, around this week, around the sale yards. And look, it's been good discussion. I think when you talk to those people that use the sale yards in the room together, very sensible, rational conversations and sensible things. Uh, The bottom line, and this is where it comes to in any of the discussions, the bottom line is that we can't keep having ratepayers of Dubbo subsidising the sale yards the way they're running now. Whatever we do, and again, even after the workshop last night, we actually had a bit of a discussion at the end of it all, and just, again, there's no voting last night, the vote will happen at a council meeting, but just my general feel, we had nine of the ten councillors there last night, if I had to take a, a straw poll there, I reckon it was pretty even about what we might do, mm. but it'll either be if we keep it, they'll have to, or we'll have to change the operating model so we're more in control of it, and the prices will have to go up. We're way below. So we're charging for a, a, a cow basically around 11 or $12 per head. You look at our main competitors, Forbes, Wagga, they're charging up around $17 and $19 a head. So they're dramatically dearer than Dubbo is. And the cattle numbers, we're number one for cattle at the moment, but sheep numbers, we're way below. So, and again, I can't remember which one it was. I think it was Forbes was about $2.25 a head. Mm. We're about $1.50 a head. So they're dramatically dearer there. But the numbers for sheep, we're about a million. Say Wagga, for example, has two million sheep a year. The prices are dearer, dramatically dearer at Forbes and Wagga. So the whole argument put forward by the whole, oh, if you put the prices up, everyone will leave. Well, the prices are a lot dearer at other sale yards. And again, we're number three in sheep in the state. So mm. there's people going to other dearer sale yards. So if we maintain it, to make sure that the rate payers of Dubbo are not subsidising that business, which would be incredibly unfair, which is unfair at the moment, we'll need to put those prices up. Or if we lease it or sell it, then maybe the price will go up. That's something that'll be out of our control. Perhaps uh, that viability does need to be looked at a little bit closer. Thank you for your time. I'm out of time. Long weekend, double to merit points. You're working all this weekend? Yeah, it's uh, it's 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, Brett. You know what it's like. All right, thanks, Matthew Dickerson.